This is season two of My Only Story. It is a co-production of the My Only Story non-profit company and News24. This is a trigger warning. If you are a survivor of sexual abuse, or if you know the people involved in the story, this podcast could be hard to listen to. If you're feeling low or triggered, please find someone to talk to at myonlystory.org. It is just before midnight on a cloudy Saturday evening in November 2018. We are in the sanatorium, or clinic, of the third most expensive school in the country. Two boys are spending the night there. Earlier, they watched television, the rugby test between the Springboks and the Scots. This is Scottish Rugby TV. But now, as it hits midnight, lights are out, and the older boy is fast asleep. But not 16-year-old Thomas Kruger. In a few minutes' time, he will get out of his bed on the upper floor. He will put on a white T-shirt and some blue and white shorts. He will take out the rope he has hidden in his backpack, and in a pair of grey socks, he will quietly step to the bedroom's window. Tom has done his research. He has practiced making the knot. And now, after midnight, he ties the rope neatly. He squeezes through a window that seems impossibly small for a high school boy, even a wiry one, like Tom. Now Thomas is sitting on the sill of the sanatorium's window. Right in front of him, in the cloudy night, lies the school's water polo pool. Thomas grabs the rope. He pulls it over his neck. He tightens the noose. And then he launches himself from the windowsill. Instantly, his spine snaps. Because Tom did his research. He is dead long before daybreak. And there he hangs all night, on the side of the sanatorium, until 9 a.m. That's when his sister enters Tom's room with breakfast on a tray. She finds an empty bed, and with the other staff, she frantically starts searching. Finally, a tuft of red hair catches someone's eye. It is sticking out above the windowsill, with the boy's stiff corpse hanging underneath. In this new season of My Only Story, we track our way through a dozen famous South African schools to try to answer a question. Why? Did Tom Kruger have to die? I'm Dion Wiggett, and this is My Only Story, a podcast and a live investigation. So, where were we? The last time we spoke, I was working in my loft here in Johannesburg, South Africa. We had just managed to dispense of one giant menace when an even larger one arrived to shut down the world. As far as pandemics go, I have had it easy. Nonetheless, not even during the Black Death did anyone suffer the indignity of being kicked out of their own loft by their own husband and forced to work on their laptop outside. Well... I wasn't quite forced outside, but Rayon's working from home has turned the once peaceful loft into a pandemonium. If they've got it reflected on their budgets, I don't need to include it here as a budget item. No, I can really think of it, it shouldn't be on my budget at all as a budget item. It's a different business unit, so it should come on. Seriously, you try catching dodgy teachers amid such a racket. And so I'm forced to sit outside on the stoop. Not that it's exactly quiet out here. And that's even before the hubby does arrive. Still, give me a hundred hardy does, but do deliver me from the violence of Rian's work life. When season one ended, I was writing the book, even though my mind kept wondering. I was over Willem Breitenbach. I was ready to start seeing other pedophiles. That is when I happened upon a mystery that would soon take over my life. 
The story is not about our previous pedophile. But if you haven't read the book, I do need to give you 30 seconds of context from 30 years ago. The events of six days in August 1990 at Gray College in Bloemfontein directly inspired my urgent new quest. But I'm tired of talking about a bullfrog named Willem Breitenbach, which is why you won't hear his name from my lips again. So to get us up to speed, here are Derek Watts and Masake Kana from Carte Blanche on Mnet. In December 2019, the much-publicized arrest of a journalist and former teacher led to a number of men coming forward saying, Me too. Dion's investigation led him to Grey College. It's well known for the many spring boxes that it has produced, as well as excellent academic results. Carte Blanche reports on Ben, who became my first brother back in season one. Ben wasn't the only one at Grey College. Breitenbach also allegedly had his way with a boy called Joshua. We contacted Grey College and the current headmaster responded with this written statement, saying he was appointed in 2013 and had no knowledge of what happened at the school 30 years ago. We suggested to the school that because Breitenbach was not investigated at the time, he was able to have access to other boys which he abused. The school responded. If this is indeed the case, it is truly a shame and a crime. I'm not going to relitigate the apparent conspiracy of silence in Bloemfontein, but after I got the full story, I phoned up some teachers and asked them to explain themselves. This did not go down well. Here is Johan Fulstiet, legendary former headmaster of Grey College, in an extremely confrontational Afrikaans interview. These things were not so well known back then, he says, and I interrupt to ask if that's why they kept it quiet. Listen to me, Mr. Wiggett. I'm answering as well as I can, but you're not going to nag at me. I'm not interested at all. Maybe this is my favorite sentence. I know what I know, and I know that I knew nothing about those things back then. What is your answer to your own question? I ask if grey boys are expected to keep quiet. And he says, nah. I think you get the gist. Basically, the current headmaster of Grey College, his name is Dion Skippers, pleads ignorance of what happened before his tenure started in 2013. But his predecessor, the now-retired Johan Falstiet, says he can't remember as far back as 1990, when he was the deputy headmaster. The headmaster at the time, Dr. Miku Haynes, died in 2020 after a long battle against Alzheimer's, Netwerk 24 reports. And so nobody takes responsibility. Not headmaster Dion Skippers, nor Johan Falstiet, who lived on the Grey College campus for 60 years. My interview with Johan Falstiet, or as they call him at Grey College, Mr. Grey, left me both furious and fearful. Furious that teachers have conveniently forgotten the lives that were ruined on their watch. And fearful that schools have not changed a bit since Grey College avoided a scandal by allowing a paedophile to become some other children's problem. But could that still happen today? If these grand schools have grown more compassionate and less arrogant in the past 31 years, we would have much less to worry about. But if these schools have only grown more arrogant, we are up a creek without a paddle. From where I'm sitting on the stoop, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that we are talking more about the fact that boys also suffer sex abuse. In 2017, we met Colin Rex from Parktown Boys in Johannesburg. Here's ENCA. Former assistant water polo coach at Parktown Boys High School, Colin Rex, has been convicted on 144 counts of sexual assault and 12 counts of common assault. In 2019 came the news of Fiona Viotti at Bishops in Cape Town. Fiona Viotti was a history teacher and water polo coach at Bishop's Diocesan College. ENCA again. The school was thrown into scandal when a matric pupil revealed they'd had a sexual relationship. 
An investigation by the school revealed Viotti had had sexual relationships with at least five boys between 2013 and 2019. And earlier this year, we heard that Dean Carlson has been arrested in Australia after quietly leaving Pearson High in Port Elizabeth. This is Australia's seven news. Dean Carrells did not... He means Dean Carlson. This morning is expected. The 40-year-old was arrested on March 20 after police raided his Malula Bar home. Carrells Carlson. was a former teacher in Budrum. An hour's drive from Brisbane on Australia's Sunshine Coast. He was also a prominent water polo coach. The case was adjourned until June 2. Things would only get worse for Dean Carlson, but we'll talk plenty more about him soon. It's good news that sexual predators are being exposed because that means people are being warned against them. There is bad news though, and it is considerable. Even though there is a pattern that is plain to see, the schools do not bother. The people in charge have not felt the need to connect any dots. If they would care to look though, they would keep hundreds of children safe. Is that not a reward worth playing for? On an autumn's afternoon, 18 months ago, I'm sitting on the stoop and I'm sifting through the tip-offs I received from season one. On a random scrap of paper, I notice a note I made. All it says is, St. Andrew's College, with an exclamation mark. What's that about? That's when I remember Charles Kruger. Or, to be more precise, I remember about some guy who phoned me from Port Elizabeth right in the middle of season one. It was November 2019, and I was also on my stoop but back in the old world, before the great lockdown. At that point, the only thing on my plate was exposing old Watts' face. Yet somehow, Shal Kruger got hold of my number. We say hello, and then almost instantly, he launches into a long story about the death of his son, Thomas Kruger, in Grahamstown just the previous year. I am impatient to get off the call. I do feel for Shal. He seems kind and gentle and possibly permanently broken. But I cannot help him. I can't help most people I would like to. And so, at the earliest chance, I tell Shoal, I'm sorry for your loss. And then I make my excuses and I hang up the phone. And then on the stoop, it is four months later and I'm looking at a scrap of paper that reads St. Andrew's College. And I'm remembering how distracted I was when someone told me his life tragedy. And so I rummage around I find Shal Kruger's name and number, and on the spur of an autumn's afternoon, I call him back and I ask if he'll please tell me again about the violent death of his son. By the time I hang up the phone, the autumn's day has turned into dusk. On the stoop, my mood has been veering from excitement to horror and back to excitement again. It's maybe a bit insensitive to say so, but the Kruger mystery as me spellbound. And so I sit back in my chair and, like a real detective, I light my metaphorical pipe to stare at the pieces of the case. There are tragic heroes and colourful villains and a violent death that may have been avoided. Still to come are secret signals, confounding code names, the suggestion of conspiracy and stakes that rise and rise. During the long lockdown that follows my conversation with Shoal, I would get uncomfortably close to the personal lives of teenage boys. My social media habits will turn bizarre. I'd learn the names of almost everyone at St. Andrew's College. I'll trail my way through the inappropriate pictures posted by schools on Facebook and Instagram. Until much, much later, I discover the most dangerous platform of them all. WhatsApp. As I get deeper into a WhatsApp group, I will find myself closer and closer to a group of vicious teachers across the country who help themselves to the children 
in the queue. They think out games to play. They compare notes and exchange pictures. They hide each other's secrets, for the secrets are also their own. Except, lately, there's been one exception. We may as well call them Deep Throat. For once, it happens to be apt. Let's reveal the secrets one by one. Let's give up the game, the very large game, that I believe to have led to the death of Thomas Kruger. The stretch is so much wider than one school. It's an infestation. As our story starts, there is only one question I must ask you to answer. Can you honestly say you trust every teacher at your child's school? After my call to Charles, it is obvious to me where my journey goes next. To the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Imagine a land where the sun shines all year over unspoilt landscapes. Eastern Cape tourism. Open spaces and pure air revitalizing body and soul. We see people boating. Imagine crystal clear water teeming with marine life. We see a whale. Imagine wild beasts roaming the bush with pride. Buffalo. Imagine friendly people filled with the spirit of Ubuntu welcoming you to explore this magical land. The birth and resting place of Madiba. Mr. Mandela. Wamkelekile in the Eastern Cape, a province that is yours to explore. Shall we? My name is Charles Kruger. I'm 50 years old and I'm a financial advisor from Port Elizabeth. Well, Port Elizabeth is what the Eastern Cape's commercial hub used to be called. But then a narrative complication in the form of a name change. My name is Charles Kruger. I'm 51 years old and I'm a financial advisor from Klebecha. When we started production on this season, the city now known as Trebecha was still called Port Elizabeth. So that's what it's called in most of our tape. In the same vein, Grahamstown is now called Makanda. But almost everyone we recorded still calls it Grahamstown. Be assured, we're not using the colonial names out of nostalgia. Quite the opposite. Rather, we're telling a story, playing a game of cat and mouse with firmly colonial roots. The action is not really set in Trebecha or Makanda. These are stories that bloomed and festered in Port Elizabeth and in Grahamstown. The names have changed, but the mystery remains. Why did Thomas Kruger have to die? And why was it necessary to break his father too? Charles always wanted to be a father. On the day he finds out that his dream is coming true, the World Trade Center is still standing in downtown Manhattan. It is two months before 9-11, July 2001, when Charles arrives home and his wife tells him the big news. It was just the most wonderful, wonderful day. It wasn't like we tried too hard, we fell pregnant naturally. Thomas is born on 20 March 2002. It's very difficult to explain to somebody that within 30 seconds of knowing a human being, you are ready to kill for it. Tom is the most incredible little chap. From the time he was born, he is wild. The guy's climbing the tree, climbing the jungle gym, falling off and cutting his chin open. But the most incredibly emotional and empathetic little boy that I've ever met. Shell says that Tom's empathy was obvious all his life. For instance, it is the winter of 2018, a few months before Tom's death. One afternoon, I need to go down to Builder's Warehouse and I say to Tom, please come with me. He says, with the greatest of pleasure. On our way down the hill, coming up towards Builder's Warehouse, he says to me, Dad, please, I would like you to take me to a home for abandoned babies. I want to go and volunteer to help look after these babies. We arrive unannounced and knock on the door and say, 
Tom would like to volunteer to help you out with these babies. We have to now go through a massive process with SAPS vetting. That is extraordinary though for a 16 year old kid. Had he been expressing an interest in children's issues or does this come like a bolt out of the blue? Completely out of the blue. For me, it was unbelievably heartwarming that a strapping 16 year old boy wanted to give back to society and looking after these totally abandoned babies. This was a few months before Tom's death, in 2018. Now, to reduce confusion and heartache, there are two years I must ask you to keep track of today. 2015 and 2018. These years are central to both this episode and to our entire story. 2015 and 2018. In 2015, Tom is desperate to get into St. Andrew's College in 2018, Tom is desperate to get out of St. Andrew's College by means of a sanatorium window. In 2015 and 2018, Thomas sets his mind to his goal. And both times, his plan succeeds. So it is 2015. We are in Port Elizabeth and Tom is a grade 7 pupil with a big dream. He wants to go live at a legendary boarding school, the splendid St. Andrew's College in Grahamstown, where character is built and boys grow into men. This is one of their war cries. But as marvellous as St. Andrew's is, it is also marvellously expensive. The school's vast campus and hallowed staff and science labs and 3D printer do not pay for themselves. The parents must pay. And very few parents can afford to. Thomas comes to me one night with fully completed scholarship application forms for St Andrews College. I am absolutely blown away that he had gone off by himself and, and did that all by himself and presented it to me. He's completed the application form, written the letter that describes why he, he thinks he should get the scholarship. A lot of it has to do with the fact that he's done so much good outside of the school and has invested so much of his time in doing good for others. We stick with 2015, but let us drive 90 minutes away from Port Elizabeth into green and rocky mountains to see what's been cooking in Grahamstown at the object of Tom's desire. As we drive into the St. Andrew's campus in 2015, we find a school in the throes of a new era. A flurry of new teachers have just been installed, chief among them a sweeping new broom. Good morning. In the shape of Principal Alan Thompson. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce myself as the 19th headmaster of St. Andrew's College. In 2015, in a video on the school's YouTube channel, Principal Thompson addresses the parents. Oh, what a wonderful sense of stewardship and custodianship of an absolute treasure. We've enjoyed our start at St Andrews enormously. From an armchair in front of an unlit marble fireplace, we see a stoutish, middle-aged man with a square face and a slight but settled frown. And, uh, we have a very real sense that this is just the most wonderful place to be both working and living, and we're enjoying Grahamstown enormously. At this point, Principal Thompson has been in office for six months. The year has started very well for college. And his administration boasts of early successes. We've had some wonderful summer sport. Our cricketers did fantastically well. We had It's the usual kind of private school shtick. We're the best because sport. Uh, our have had fantastic success. Sport. We hosted our own regatta at Settlers Dam. Sport. Our water polo is a fast growing sport and record number of boys turning out for water polo. Sport. We've enjoyed a wonderful rugby festival at St. Stidians. Sport. Hockey is doing well. Bit of academics. We had a 100% metric pass rate, which is to be expected, but what was really impressive was the fact that all of those boys achieved university entrance qualifications. And then a quick look in from these guys. The sort of third leg to the pot is the cultural side of the school. A really progressive and challenging production of Metamorphosis. It went down well. It was a challenging piece, but played to great reviews. Oh, and then... The spiritual life at college is healthy. Father Gary does a wonderful job preparing boys for confirmation. These stunning outcomes give some insight into just how fine an education you can buy if you have 300,000 rand per boy per year including boarding, but excluding optional, not optional, extramural activities. 
Indeed, it doesn't take Alan Thompson long to acknowledge the financial and reputational challenges these expensive schools face. One of our key priorities is ensuring that we have strong demand and driving demand. We're looking to create real excellence in everything that we do. And then the new headmaster expresses his wish in an unusual royal plural. It's my hope that we are able to hold the trust and tradition that's been left to us and we're able to nurture it and enable the school just to continue to flourish and to live as a deeply traditional school that's respectful of its great heritage, but at the same time is a really state-of-the-art, progressive, modern, forward-thinking institution. Still in 2015, it is a few months later, and we are at the Kruger family home in Port Elizabeth. We get sent an email from the school to say he's been awarded the scholarship. Ecstatic, ecstatic. The two of us are beaming with pride, knowing full well that he had done all of this by himself. It just absolute elation at the fact that he's accepted into this fine institution. Thomas was over the moon. We were all ready and set for Tom to start his new journey at St Andrews College in 2016. We are still in 2015, and the Kruger family arrive on campus for a grand tour of their son's new home. We are just blown away by the beauty, the heritage, the culture, the beauty of the campus, how friendly everyone was. As the Krugers stroll across the vast campus, they would have noticed the six distinct hostels, or houses, where the boys of St. Andrew's board. The oldest one, Upper House, dates from the 1850s, and they just don't build them like this anymore. Elegant, old-world dormitories that seem both grand and intimate, like Hogwarts in Harry Potter, but with South African accents. Just like in Harry Potter, the students at St. Andrew's get divided into houses. There's even a sorting hat of sorts. The house to which you're assigned at St. Andrews is every bit as crucial as in Harry Potter. If you're in Gryffindor, you never get to see the dorms at Ravenclaw or the dungeons at Slytherin. That's St. Andrews for you. You see school through the eyes of your house. Its leaders and culture completely dominate your high school experience. If you're in Espen House, you'll be there from grade eight to matric, and it's highly unlikely that you'll spend much time in the bathrooms at Merriman House or be hugged in the hallways of Upper House. Of the six houses, today we need to note just one of them, Espen House, where Tom Kruger will live until the last year of his life, 2018. So let us move three years forward now, from 2015 to 2018, and the final days of Thomas Kruger's life. It is Thursday, 15 November 2018, on one of the impeccable green fields at St. Andrew's College. Thomas and his classmates are standing ready to participate in one of their school's great traditions. On paper, it seems like an excellent idea. Together with the grade 10 girls of Sister School DSG, that's the Diocesan School for Girls, the grade 10 boys of St. Andrew's will embark on the legendary John Jones Fish River journey, or simply journey for the next three weeks, without phones but with adult supervision, they will hike, row, scramble and climb their way from the source of the Great Fish River until finally on day 21 they reach the river's mouth and the Indian Ocean and everyone sprints over the sand and into the sea while laughing and crying and congratulating each other. Like in this audio from 2016. We're so good, it's unbelievable. But back to Journey's start on an impeccable green field. We're standing next to the Kruger family and a crowd of other parents who have all come to see off their sons and daughters. Young Thomas has been at St. Andrews for almost three years now, and they have been turbulent years, to say the least. We'll talk about that next time. But by November 2018, it looks like Tom has put the worst of it behind him. This is actual audio from Tom's class getting ready for Journey. Next to a wide green field in Grahamstown, Charles Kruger captures the scene on video. 
I would say Tom looks like any slightly awkward high school boy embarking on an adventure, laughing and yelling and hugging his mates and fist bumping random people. In four days' time, he will be dead. As the parents leave, the boys and girls stand ready for inspection. There is a company there with sniffer dogs. They're instructed to put down their backpacks in a row in front of them. Shal Kruger has one last look through the fence. I see and I get the feeling that Tom's nervous. The kids have received lists of items they need to take and also of items that are strictly forbidden. It gives me no pleasure to say this, but the sniffer dog should reconsider his or her career in security. The sniffer dog walks straight past his bag. I could see him almost jump for joy. I'm really not here to give the sniffer dog shade. He or she is not a bad dog. Merely extremely incompetent. Maybe if the dog detected what Thomas was hiding, everything would have turned out differently. But instead, off the sniffer dog trots to the next group. Presumably finding nothing in those backpacks either. As the new group placed their backpacks down, I called Tom over to the fence that we were looking through for one last goodbye. I have a, a black bangle that Thomas gave me six years before this. I take it off and I put it on his wrist. And I say to him, my boy, this is the most valuable possession I have. Please bring it back to me safely. And those were the last words I say to Thomas Lester Charles Kruger. I went to see Tom in First Avenue funeral parlor um, to say goodbye to him. And I removed the bangle off his wrist in the room in the funeral parlor. Is that the bangle on your wrist there? I do have the bangle on my wrist. Bloody thing's about to bust, so I'm going to go and have it tattooed onto my wrist. Yeah. Very warm welcome to you and welcome to St Andrews College. Headmaster Alan Thompson again. Our virtual tour of the campus. But now during and, the pandemic. Uh, obviously, it would be much nicer to have you here in person. But first, another trigger warning for bagpipe music. Here in person and show you around the campus myself and I look forward to the opportunity to being able to do that. But in the meantime, St Andrew is the patron saint of Scotland and 10,000 kilometers away at St Andrews College in Grahamstown, the Scottish spirit is still vigorously celebrated. Uh, you'll begin to discover some of the magic of this place. Sooner or later, uh, the opportunity always, to really there are bagpipes. The sport and culture and academics the opportunity to discover your own little uniqueness in life and to really flourish and prosper. By 2021, so enjoy the tour. Principal Alan really Thompson has seen uh, two entire cohorts through high school. Most recently, Tom Kruger's class, who matriculated last year, 2020, but without their friend, doormate and classmate Tom, who missed his matric exams by more than two years. media, we report thoroughly on cabinet ministers and do deep dives into the tenures of even minor CEOs. But seldom do we take the opportunity to rate the famous headmasters. These elite headmasters have monumental influence in the world of education, but we don't even know their names, never mind their views on the issues facing our children. What can we do about naughty schools and teachers who won't listen? I think maybe it's time for some discipline around here. Some detention time for the teachers who have failed. If a huge investigative hoo-ha is the only way these schools will listen, well, let's have a big hoo-ha. It's not that I have something against schools. It just seems to me that some schools have something against children. Could it be that window? That's me, earlier this year, on the St. Andrew's campus in Grahamstown. 
I am standing outside the two-story sanatorium with producer Alison Pope, and we are trying to work out through which window Thomas hung himself. The way Charles describes it is that Tom would have had to squeeze his body through, uh, and that window is bigger. Yeah, it is. I think it. I think it has to be on on the on side the here, side. like. He would have been discovered much earlier if he was on this side yes, of the building absolutely, because, because of all the cars driving the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Along with the swimming pool, the sanatorium forms the northern reaches of the St. Andrews campus. But before I got on the ground in Grahamstown, there is something else I didn't appreciate. The fact that Tom's adoptive home, Espenhaus, is barely three minutes' walk from the sanatorium. It's like a lopsided triangle, with the sanatorium and the swimming pool on top an Espen house at the bottom. I think it has to be this window. I mean, it's there's a burglar bar over the top of the small window now, but I don't see any other likely candidates. So here I am, in front of the sanatorium, with Espen house to my left and the polo pool on my right. I imagine Tom's young body hanging stiff in the breeze. I have the same question on my mind that most of us do. What could possibly have been so bad that a boy with his whole life ahead of him would just decide one night to end it all. And to end it all so publicly. This is what a place to hang yourself. For the record, suicide is almost always a tragedy. But if someone is driven to suicide and we are trying to understand why, there are clues to be found in how they chose to die. Where and how and when did they do it? All of this is significant. And we'll talk about all that later this season. But for now, from the sanatorium in Grahamstown, I cannot stop staring in the direction of Espen House. Why hang yourself just minutes from your dorm? I'm thinking one could do worse than to dig around Espen House for a bit. Maybe Espen House can shed some light on the untimely death of Tom. So we get going. Yeah. This place gives me the creeps. John, there are no words to describe the loss of a child. And it's highly cliche to say no parent should ever have to bury a child. So your life gets turned upside down. There is just no way to describe the pain. I suppose I can describe it to you. Is it but it's like you're getting flu and your body, your body starts to ache. We'll multiply that by a thousand times and that's how I feel sitting right here now. And it won't go away. You can't drink it away, you can't. There is nothing I can do to get rid of it. I haven't been able to work. Most days I cannot get out of bed, still to this day. And it's nearly three years down the line. This loss and pain, knowing that Tom was in my eyes, carrying a burden that was too great for him to share. He shared everything with me, Dion. He just couldn't share that with me. I think he realized there that would, there was no way out for him other than to, to end his own life. And actually, there was a way out. There was a way out. He could have, we could have dealt with it. I asked Charles what he would say to other parents. My primary objective through all of this is to prevent it from happening to your child. Because from what I've read and investigated over the last two and a half years, is that this is rife in institutions across South Africa. And it's got to stop. Because this can happen to your child. Okay? Because it happened to my child and the outcome was life-changing for everyone involved. More heartache and pain I have never felt in my life before. I'm not scared of pain. But this is not a pain you want to go through. So the primary objective is to make sure that this does not happen to your kid. And if the institution has enabled it, they need to be held accountable for their actions. Since Tom's horrible death at the end of 2018, Charles has been consumed by getting justice for his son and by changing the system that led to Tom's death. The institution needs to be held accountable. But most of all, the abuser needs to be held accountable. But first, I want to bring us back to the stoop 18 months ago, to the afternoon I phoned back Charles Kruger. After our long conversation, Charles forwards me three voice notes. 
three voice notes he found on his late son's iPhone. To be honest, as much as Charles got me drawn to this case, it was the voice notes that got me hooked. Week after week, I'd find myself listening to the same three voice notes over and over as they tumbled me into an apparent universe of secret codes and signals. When you listen to the voice notes, you'll be as baffled as I used to be. What do these words mean? And what's the deal with the strange emojis I keep seeing in other WhatsApp conversations between teachers and teenage boys? But then, late one night on the stoop, I'm listening and re-listening to the same three voice notes. When a new word suddenly strikes me as odd, that's the moment I make a connection that's been staring at me since the start. The connection is bacon. Sometimes the word bacon is spoken or written. Most often, though, the bacon is an emoji. Do have a look at the bacon emoji on your phone. It's two crispy rashes in horizontal parallel. In the current iteration of my phone's keyboard, it's between the waffle and the T-bone steak. I do love me some bacon, but every time I see the bacon emoji now, I feel nauseous. It has come to mean something else to me now, and it makes me lose my appetite completely. Anyway, enough talking about the clues and the codes in the voice notes. Shall we have a quick listen? The voice of young Tom from beyond the grave. How's it? Um, yeah, I'm in Grahamstown. I'm going to distribute the chocolates. Uh, I looked at them now. I think I know all of them. Um, Thomas is obviously me. Next time on My Only Story. If you're listening to this podcast in September 2021, this is both a manhunt and a live investigation. Did you know Thomas Kruger? And do you think you know where the story is heading? Please get in touch with me via myonlystory.org. Unburden yourself. Let me in on your secret, and I will take care of the rest. Wherever you find an elite school, you'll find a code of silence. But when a code of silence creates a hiding place for the dregs of humanity, it needs to be overridden by a code of decency, a code of honor and of righteousness. You know, all those noble values that are codified and espoused by every elite school, but then get subsumed in the name of reputation and of secrecy and silence. Silence does not save children from harm. Determination does. And that is really what my only story is about. Having a voice. Making a big noise. Trying to keep children away from the adults who want to deceive them. Help me to complete this investigation. In the next six weeks, in the South African spring, help me to get rid of a ring of teachers who may have their eyes on a child near you. As the boys in orchestra of St. Andrew's College valiantly set out on their five-verse-long school hymn, I need to say a huge thank you to the dozens of people who have already given me their time. The boys and girls, men and women, parents and guardians, and various people of compassion. And here's a huge big shout-out to the teachers and coaches who have been willing to talk to me so far. If you're an adult participant in these stories, you're either for us or against us. If you're for us, please get in touch. If you're against us, we'll get in touch with you. The headmaster of St. Andrews, Alan Thompson, responded this week to questions from News24. He said Thomas Kruger, quote, was a very well-known and much-loved member of the community. We have reviewed every step of this incident and believe that we did everything possible in the best possible faith with the information that we had. We were in regular contact with Tom's parents and Tom himself was engaging in a positive way. This is a tragedy unlike anything we have seen before or since. End quote. Headmaster Thompson says the death of Thomas remains unexplained. Quote, We do not know and to speculate and to engage with rumor would dishonor the memory of Tom, which we cherish and respect deeply. 
We investigated every aspect of this incident, reviewed it independently, and found no obvious triggering event. End quote. For more reaction from Alan Thompson and other parties, see the reporting on news24.com. Whoever you are, please continue sending me your information and your tip-offs. You can contact me completely confidentially at myonlystory.org or message us on WhatsApp or Telegram on 072-382-7030. Myonlystory.org is also the place to go for bonus materials and loads of resources about recovering from sexual abuse. My Only Story is written and edited by me, Dion Wiggett. The executive producer is Alison Pope. The associate producer is Notula Magnati. And the sound engineer is Sean Jeffress. The original score is by Charles Johann Lingenfelder. And our artwork is by Carla Kriese. Additional reporting by News 24's Sesona Nkakamba. News 24's production manager is Charlene Ruth. And their editor-in-chief, Adrian Basson, is our editorial advisor. Special thanks to Sheldon Marias and Mpoa Dabadife. At myonlystory.org, there are loads of links to people to talk to, depending on where you are in the world. If you're in South Africa, you can always, always phone SADAG on 0800-456-789. It's sequential and easy to remember. 0800-456-789. My Only Story is out every Thursday at 5 a.m. South African time. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow the developments all week long at news24.com. This has been a co-production of the My Only Story nonprofit company and News24.